Okay, well, welcome again. Um, this is the last talk, the last Zoom talk we have as part of this year's Sterling Photography Festival. Um, it's been a super programme and we're finishing our Zoom talks on an absolute high with, uh, with the audience that we have tonight for, for Paul's talk. Just a little bit of admin as we go. Um, we're quite a big group tonight, so I'm asking everyone to mute themselves on entry, please. It just means that we get minimum distractions. Um, and we're going to use a uh, chat function uh, for capturing your questions. So during the course of Paul's presentation tonight, if you have any questions for him, can you just type them into chat and uh, we'll pick them up at the end of the session, if that's okay, everyone. Anyone who might want to use um, any uh, captioning um, uh, facility, then if you go down to the options at the bottom of your screen, you should have the options to click on your captioning and transcription services. We're recording tonight's talk so that we can upload it to our YouTube channel um, at the end of the festival, so uh, hence why we're recording tonight. So thank you all for coming. Absolutely delighted, as I say, to have Paul with us. Um, Paul's going to talk to us tonight um, about um, how to take a mindful approach to photography. Um, we're running this uh, in partnership with the University of Stirling's Be Connected programme. Um, and Sarah uh, from the Art Collection at the University is here with us tonight. We've been partners on the festival and a number of events this year. So we're absolutely delighted to be working with the University. And they run a program called Be Connected, um, which is a program which offers social well-being and cultural resources to students uh, on campus. So I hope we've got a lot of students with us here tonight. So welcome, Sarah, and thanks for, for being with us tonight. But over to Paul now, because Paul and I really have only met online. Can I say that? Yeah, we've only met online. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we were planning the festival earlier this year, um, I happened to come across a talk uh, by Paul online um, where he was talking about photography and mental well-being. Um, so we had a chat and uh, I was absolutely delighted, Paul, when you said you were able to come and uh, work with us tonight on the Sterling Photography Festival, Flow 2021. Um, Paul uh, is a photographer, a professional photographer, has had a very colourful and varied career working in fashion, advertising, uh, press photography, working with Reuters and um, latterly as picture editor with the Times. So a very varied career. And then I think it was about 2011, 2012, Paul, you moved into landscape photography and yeah. put some focus into photography for um, well-being and mental health. Um, so absolutely delighted that you're with us tonight. Um, and so without delaying any further, I think, Paul, we, we hand over to you and, and um, immerse ourselves. Um, so thank you very much, Paul. Welcome. Uh, thank you, Jane. It's really, um, it's really great to, uh, to kind of virtually um, be here. Um, you know, it would have, been, uh, would have been very nice to be able to do it in person, but... Um, and it's not the nicest night for driving home, so uh, I, I shall stay here in Kent and um, uh, speak to you all over the world, which is actually the, the bonus of Zoom, it means that people from all over the place can join us. So uh, welcome everybody, no matter how far away you are, um, it's, great to, it's great to be here. And as, uh, as, as Janie said, I, I, um, I started my career as sort of in fashion and advertising, and then I, I moved into into news basically because I'd run out of money and I needed to get a steady job um, and I um, I had a great love of news photography um, but it was really the photography side of it that I loved and not necessarily the news but I, I had a, a career that uh, started in uh, 1991 in the Midlands in Daventry um, not the most glamorous of towns and ended up um, as picture editor of the Times which um, sounds a lot more glamorous than it is but it was a great job to have um so i've always photographed you know the story but never paid attention to my um to my own story and and that's um you know that's quite a big problem really because i was taught as a as a news photographer to always concentrate on the story and understand and i had no time as a news photographer or as a picture editor to actually just stop and and stare and be conscious and aware of my own life. 
And being picture out of the times nearly, nearly destroyed me. I lost my identity to that role in every single way. Um, and I lost complete contact with everything I valued. Um, and then in 2011, I had a, a breakdown and I ended up deciding to leave to become a landscape photographer as such. Over the last 10 years, I have developed my photography into a sort of more mindful approach. And that's what I'm gonna talk about tonight. And it's sort of regaining my identity through photography and using photography for well-being, but paying attention to, to things in a, in a different sort of way. As it's a photography talk, I thought I'd start it with a poem. Um, you know, what's not to love about poetry? This is probably my favorite poem. And um, for, you will all, uh, most of you will know it, I'm sure. Um, but I'll, I'll read it to you in case you can't read the screen or you've got the screen muted. Um, so it's Leisure by W.H. Davis. Um, and it, it goes, what is this life if full of care? We have no time to stand and stare, no time to stand beneath the boughs and stare as long as sheep or cows. No time to see when woods we pass, where squirrels hide their nuts in grass. No time to see in broad daylight, streams full of stars like skies at night. No time to turn at beauty's glance and watch her feet how they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can and rich that smile her eyes began. A poor life this is full of care, we have no time to stand and stare. And for me, that is one of the most mindful poems because it's about noticing, it's about being aware, it's about taking time to pay attention to the little things, the mundane things. And we live our life at such a frantic pace, striving to achieve that we actually miss things that are, are worth living for. Um, and a lot of us, you know, myself included, went through a spell where I was, wasn't so much living, I was existing. Um, I was a bit like a zombie going into work, home from work, into work, home from work. And life was all about work. There was no time for me. And it's, it's interesting when you take a step back and start to make time for yourself, and start to make time for the things you enjoy, even if it's only five minutes a day, life suddenly becomes a lot, a lot, lot richer. Minor White is my favorite photographer. Um, he's a, an American photographer, uh, sadly dead now. And he was, he was very um, mindful and aware in his, in his approach to photography. So this quote from him, no matter what role we are in, photographer behold a critic, inducing silence for seeing in ourselves. We are given to see from the sacred place. And from that place, the sacredness of everything may be seen. And that essentially means that everything is beautiful. Everything is worth seeing. And photography and mindfulness together saved my life. They gave me um, a way of expressing what was going on in my head um, that I couldn't, I couldn't vocalize. Just like most middle-aged men who have a breakdown, it's very hard to express how you feel to somebody half your age um, who sits there smiling and asking you how you are all the time. So I used to lie to my, my therapist about things, um, you know, but mindfulness is, is about, it's about paying attention. It's about being open and present to a moment of clarity that is unique to each of us. And then we can, we can embrace the, the, the grace, the beauty, the conflict, the, the life, the death, the imperfection, and that the delicate balance for the moment as it sort of, as it, as it grows and peaks and then disperses. And everything we see is in a constant state of change. Nothing stays the same. And when we, when we photograph, what we're photographing is the space between our breaths. We're photographing the stillness of motion we're catching a series of moments that will move our spirit and connect with our emotions, stirring our, our hearts and our imaginations. And hopefully it does that not only to the photographer, but also to the viewer. And photography is a very personal thing, but often we, we try to conform. We try to, 
to photograph what's already been photographed to you know to sort of copy in the hope that it it, it gets us somewhere and there's always part of us missing when we do that so one of the things that I find really amusing is when people say, oh, you take really beautiful photos, you must have a good camera. Um, yes, because it's the good camera that takes the picture, not the photographer. I'm sure Picasso had a really nice paintbrush and JK Rowling has a fantastic pen. Um, you know, but the most important thing is that if somebody said, you take really beautiful photographs, you must have an open heart, you must have a a kind heart, you must have a loving nature, you must have an appreciation of imperfection. They're the things to value as a photographer, as an artist, as a writer, as a poet, as a human being. Because it's only by paying attention to things in an open and loving way that we start to be allowed to see the beauty. It's only by standing in silence and with stillness and with kindness that something starts to, to show you a beauty that if you were rushing, it would go by. So the subject becomes the co-creator and with it, it's visual gift. And I, I absolutely love that. So photography is a celebration of imperfection. You see and feel beyond the, beyond the image, just beyond the subject. The subject should reach into your heart and help you see a unique connection between the two of us. The subject and, and you, the photographer, become one. We meet in openness and honesty, both giving our best at a particular moment in time without judgment, without harsh judgment anyway. Um, and that's really important because it allows you to see this unruly, disobedient, difficult part of beauty, you know, that defies that defies perfection and shines brighter because of it. And, and if we can accept that what we're photographing is beautiful despite its um, imperfections and perceived flaws, we can accept those in ourselves. And that actually makes us better people as well. All photographers and artists should embrace their vulnerability, but often we hide behind this cloak of ego and awards and success you know, but that, that's not authentic. Uh, if you can be authentic in your seeing, your pictures reveal so much about you and the subject. And that's really important, you know, to, so I, I use um, the sort of the visual power of equivalence. And, and that allows me to ask questions of the subject, but it also allows the subject, however inanimate it is, to ask questions of me. And it takes time to answer them. But equivalence is really, it's just using the subject as a metaphor. Um, and it's a metaphor for a feeling that I have about something, whether it's about myself or my life or my place in the world, but it's not always about the subject of the photograph. So using photography as a metaphor is, is really powerful because it means I can tell the world exactly how I'm feeling on a day without telling anybody and just presenting a picture that some people will accept as just a picture of a tulip or whatever, and other people will read into it their own story. And we have to allow our own story to come through. So beauty plants seeds of inspiration. And you know, it, it kind of, it's a bit like water. If you let it, it kind of seeps into every part of you and, and it will find the uniqueness in every moment, if you pause, if you give it chance, if you allow it time. To, to develop. So for me, photography is giving myself over to openness. It's approaching everything with surprise and wonder and awe, a childlike fascination, um, working with the subject and, and just looking at the patterns and the ideas and the inspiration offered to me. And it's a chance to just see and to be, not to do. We spend a lot of time doing and not very much time being. And, and I, I love the connection with a subject when I experience a moment of exquisite beauty. Um, and photography is about experience. It's not the place of a photographer to judge whether something is good enough or too ugly or, or whatever. 
but to pay attention to the flaws and the imperfection because that's where beauty and uniqueness truly lie. We are all individuals. We are all beautiful in our own way. We are all flawed. But it's those flaws that give us personalities. And our subjects have personalities, but often we spend a lot of time retouching our images to be perfect and they lose that personality. Um, you know, so I think we have to be a little bit careful. You know, so I like to allow the image to be what it is. I like to allow the subject just to be what it is, not try to make it into something else, not wish it was better. So it's a true collaboration of a shared moment between me and the subject, both exposing our flaws to each other. You know, and, and if you see beauty and disfigurement together as one, they give rise to really powerful moments that can, that can move you and, and feel deeply into yourselves and force you to, to look hard at yourself. And not to ask if you're good enough, but just to, just to look hard at yourself and see where your beauty lies. And you know, for me, photography is about communication. You know, it's about communication with light. And we offer a vision of, of our reality that's unique to the, the photographer or artist who's in that moment. If we all stood in a line, all 40 something of us, um, we would all see the same subject differently. But we might start judging whether one person has got a better vision of it. And that's, only, that's a natural human condition. You know? but if we embrace what is unique to us and our uniqueness, other people will start to understand it and that communication will go quite deep. You know, so if we communicate with the viewer, we've also communicated with the subject. The subject has communicated with us and people will spend more time looking and thinking and observing and seeing deeply into and feeling the images. Every single person is creative. We are all born with the same amount of creativity. You know, we all, we all have an artist or a poet in our hearts. You know, we just need to embrace our, our own vision, our own unique voice and not seek external validation because external validation doesn't give contentment. External validation always pushes you to ask if you're good enough. You know, and that's one of the the strange thing so accepting that you're unique and accepting that you are on a different part of the learning curve to everybody else means that at the point you photograph something or you write something you are good enough you know i mean and that's the thing i have asked myself am i good enough almost every single day while i was working in news i was always asking it i felt like i was a complete imposter did I, did I deserve the job as picture editor of the Times? Did I deserve to be shooting great events for Reuters? Um, you know, did I deserve the breaks? Am I good enough? Am I worthy? And, you know, the, the time that I spent working at the Times, I, I, was, I was constantly bullied and undermined by other staff. And they made me feel unworthy of every single aspect of my life. And I, I questioned whether I was not only worth, worthy of being picture editor of the Times, but whether I was worthy of being a father, whether I was worthy of being a husband, and eventually whether I was worthy of being alive. And for me, pushing the, you know, the dizzying heights of that greasy pole that is Fleet Street, I actually became completely numb to myself. I was dead to who I really am. I lost my real identity. Um, I was ashamed of my personal likes and dislikes and, and often didn't speak up when it mattered. Um, and I, I subsequently had a tremendous battle with my mental health, which is well documented. And I'm not afraid or stigmatized by the fact that I had a breakdown and I suffer with anxiety and depression. Um, for me, weirdly now, it's a strength. Um, you know, but I lost the joy of the experience of life for nearly 10 years. And that's incredible because I look now at things 
and I see such joy and appreciation of the simple beauty that I've got around me that it's incredible to think at one point I was literally blind to it. And you know, through photography, I've gradually found a way back to who I really am. I've navigated a way, a way back into my, into my soul, into my real person. Um, and I, I've used photography to, to speak where I can't, um, to, to support you know, where I can't. And it's given me a, a, a much deeper connection with my Christian faith. Uh, because for me, what I photograph is the beauty of creation. And I'm not here to, you know, convince you all to follow Jesus or God or whatever, you know, but for me, if you're photographing, you're photographing something much bigger than you. You know, if you're photographing nature, certainly much bigger than you. Um, you know, so through stillness and quiet, I've been able to sort of really connect with not only my faith, but the unique beauty of the creation that surrounds me. And, and through that, I've, I've really sort of, started, you know, really enjoyed my place in the world. And I've, I've worked out how small I am in the world, but how big an impact I, I have. The quiet acceptance of, of each moment, to me, it's a gift. You have to live the expo experience before the exposure. Um, and that gives me a, a personal and spiritual and emotional validation to my life. I need no external person telling me my work is good enough because it, it matches the experience that I was having at the time. And if it matches that experience, if it comes close to, to bringing that back to, back to me when I see the, the prints, then I know that work is good enough. It might not sell, it might not go on a gallery wall, it might only get one like on Instagram or Facebook or whatever, but that doesn't matter. If it's the best I could do on the day, then that's good enough for me. The moment of stillness and calm and inner silence allow you access to every part of the experience because photography is, it's visceral. You know, we use every single part of our body and all of our senses when we make a photograph because you have to be fully immersed in the, in the moment. You can't be in a bubble, removed from it, because if it doesn't move you in some way, if you don't connect with it, if you can't have a conversation, then you're gonna to struggle to make a picture that resembles the experience. And that goes for whether you're photographing news, a wedding, um, portraits or landscapes, or even still life. That translates across everything. You've got to use every single ounce of awareness in your body, every sense. You know, it, it's really important that we, we get part of, part of it. So I, I like to live every moment of every image, be the experience, live the experience. You know, be in the moment, they say. And that's, and that's it. And it's, it's by paying full attention to each and every moment that you take part in the images and they become a part of you and then they become part of your soul and that's when they start to become unique individual and you start to develop uh, a style or a consistency in your work uh, and that that's really important consistency is is key to i think success as a photographer it's not about whether you take one fantastic picture a year and the rest are average. It's about taking the stuff that you like often enough. So you build consistency, you build confidence. You know, photography is about making decisions. What will we include? What will we exclude? Where do I focus? What will I ignore? What will I accept? What's the compromise? Why is this interesting? Why am I photographing this? What is my story in this? And by asking those questions, it actually helps us to, to shape our sense of self, but also understand the meaning of space and our place in that space. You know, so it's, it's one of those things that the more, you, the more you step back, the more questions you ask, the more you start to connect. And the first question I always ask is, why have I stopped? What is it about this that interests me? 
And then I distill the picture down to the very essence of what interests me. And I forget about the big picture. Often it's not about the big picture, often it's the small details. So with, with careful cultivation of the, the details, we can gain a, a much better appreciation of, of the qualities of light, of pattern, of texture, of shape, of form, of space, of distance. And when we, when we deliberately pay attention to the, the rhythm and the narrative and the emotion in something, we, you know, we gain something. We become richer for the experience. Photography doesn't have rules. It has guidelines, it has genres, it has techniques, it has a history. Um, you know, but we can learn from, from those, we can be inspired by those, but we don't have to slavishly copy what other people have done. We can use them as stepping stones and building blocks. And we can pull from one genre and add to another. Um, and change them around and turn them on their heads and be as creative and experimental as we like because photography is just play. I mean, simply it's child's play. It's not rocket science, it's child's play. And each of us has a duty to play. And often we forget the ability to play as we grow. So, so let the moment that you're in take you, let it, let it guide you, let it hold your hand and take you on an adventure that you don't know where it's going. You know, lose the, the grip on the end goal. Let go of the obsession with making a great photograph to win an award or to fill a portfolio space. Step back and allow yourself to dissolve into something and actually you'll make a greater photo. You'll make a more impactful photo. You'll make a more honest photo. You may win the competition if you enter it, who knows, good luck. I never win competitions. You know, so follow what the subject suggests. You know, go with it, ask it questions. Don't imprison the subject in your own desires. Don't force it to be something it's not. Allow it to express itself. You know, in the same way that people allow you to express yourselves for the most part, allow the subject to do that. Embrace and accept what the subject has, don't judge it. So, you know, be curious, be intrigued, be excited, you know, use expression and the lived experience to suggest the exposure that you might make, not the technical perfection that is suggested by so many. Let go of that end game, let go of the kudos, be kind to yourself in, instead. You know, be kind to your subject instead. Kindness is a much better attribute to have than 100,000 likes. Photography for me is meditation. It's, it's care of myself. It's kindness to myself. It's the greatest act of love um, in a way of the world that I can, that I can actually perform. You know, meditation's not about sitting on a cushion with an empty mind in the lotus position. Photography and meditation are perfect companions because meditation's really about controlling where your mind goes and allowing yourself to be focused on what is important to you at that point. You know, so paying attention to your subject is a perfect meditation. Jack Kerouac um, says in his book Essential to Prose, be submissive to everything. Open listening, no judgment, enjoy the dignity of the experience, be in love with your life. If you change listening to seeing, there's a great lesson for photography. I've probably misquoted Jack Kerouac. I hope he, I hope he forgives me. Um, but we have a great lesson there. Do not be ashamed of how you see or what you see, embrace it. Do not let other people tell you your life isn't worth loving. Do not, you know, do not think it's not good enough because you are a unique, beautiful creature who sees the world in a uniquely beautiful way. And that is what we're celebrating. We celebrate our differences. 
So paying attention through awareness is the very nature, the very essence of seeing. And each of us sees everything differently. You know, so celebrating that, celebrating those differences, the diversity of seeing and not sticking to convention brings us to a, to a place where we find joy, we find forgiveness, we find understanding, we find patience. So I practice seeing every second of every day. I love seeing. Seeing for me is, is magical. And I don't mind what I see. I don't go out in the morning and say, right, today I'm going to see something that's this or that's that. I just go out and enjoy things that catch my eye. Um, and it does take me longer to walk everywhere. Um, and that's fine. You know, so I see with, with joy. I see with intrigue, with fascination. Yeah, and they're wonderful things to, to be open about. They're, they're wonderful things to, to play with. You know, and you know, if you're a student, that's what people are trying to get you to do. Be open, be intrigued, be fascinated. Um, because then you can move on to a level above, you know, above your peers. You know, see with empathy, with kindness, with love. And enjoy every second of it. See with vulnerability. Allow that vulnerability to come through. Celebrate the broken bits. You know, the, the Japanese have a fantastic thing where they repair broken objects and they repair them with gold because they believe that the, the cracks add to the story. You know, we in the Western world try and hide our cracks. I, I hid my cracks for a long time before they, they eventually revealed themselves. Um, you know, but actually, had I not had all of that trouble, pain, anguish, I wouldn't see the world in the way I do now. Um, you know, see with humour, you know, frustration, be angry about stuff, but present it beautifully. Uh, no matter what you see, see the peace and always the beauty. However unconventional or difficult it may be, how hard it sits for you, um, you know, just see the, the simple beauty of things, the fragile beauty. So be simple, be honest, be open, you know, be the eyewitness to your time and your life. Don't worry about the nostalgic side of things. Embrace the, the beauty of now and not wishful thinking. Don't, don't think, oh, the grass is always greener. If I go to Iceland, I'll get a fantastic picture of a mountain in the snow. Or if I go to America, I'll get a fantastic. There are fantastic pictures to be had on your doorstep, in your garden, in your house, in your flat, in your kitchen, in your bathroom, in your bedroom, wherever you may be. There are photographs to be made. There are poems to be written. And photography is visual poetry. It doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't have to rhyme. It doesn't have to have particular rhythm. Photography is about now. It's about the present moment. It's about you. It's about you at this time in your life. You know, so when we photograph, we're photographing now. We're photographing the now with authenticity and it's unblinking authenticity. We don't need to travel back in time. We don't need to go to amazing locations. We don't need to alter our images to tell a different story. Each image we make is our legacy. It's our, it's our story to our past. You know, and, and pictures that are rich in the story of our present are really important because we celebrate pictures that are imperfect from years ago. If you look at the pictures of Ansel Adams, Cartier Bress, and you know, numerous others, they're not perfect, but they, they tell the truth of their moment. Whereas we're very busy photoshopping out the satellite dish, the telephone box, the telegraph pole, the rubbish in the streets. It's okay to tell the truth of now because that's what now is about. So open heart, open eyes, you know, be appreciative in full awareness of the, of the joy that a simple thing can bring you without expecting reward or validation. Just create for creation's sake. 
just for you, without any joy, without any judgment, just for joy. You know, embrace the way the subject presents itself to you. Look at the texture, look at the pattern, look at the movement, feel deeply into the subject and appreciate every single part of it. You know, celebrate the, the hugeness of the world. Be fascinated by every single tiny detail and leave no stone visually unturned thinking that the next one might be better or the next one after that might be better. It's not about the destination photography. Photography is about the journey. Photography is photographing and stopping on the way to the destination and maybe not actually getting to the destination because the destination is usually unimportant but the journey is so much more fun. Be fascinated by the ordinary, the mundane, the everyday, and celebrate the interconnectedness of items. Somebody somewhere has created something out of need, and they've, they've been inspired by something to create whatever it is they've made. Therefore, it's the most beautiful thing that they could produced at the time and even what they produce is a collaboration you've got designers you've got metal workers you've got artists you've got the guy who screws the cameras to the uh, to the wall he didn't have to screw them in like that could have screwed them in at an odd angle um, even the guy who drives them at the uh, at the cctv center you know who pans them round. they're all part of the the creation of the moment you know Every part of photography is gratitude. It's a, a show of appreciation and respect to the person who developed our subject. You know, and when we pay attention to our subject, we're photographing them and us at the same time. And that, when you think about it, is, is beautiful. So if you're grateful in your appreciation, you can understand and feel the hands and the, the, the skill and the attention that the, the, the person who made or designed or, or positioned your subject, you can feel their love and passion for it. You're photographing their spirit in every single thing that you, you see. Everything you record is a team effort. Everything is a collaboration. None of it is just you. Minor White said, be still with yourself until the object of your attention reveals itself to you. Take and make the time to see. Take and make the time to be with your subject. Explore it. Sit with it. Understand it. Watch how the light moves across it. Listen to the sounds around it. Taste whatever's on the air. Let your senses guide you with the subject. That stillness will reveal the spirit of your subject and it will touch the very heart of you. And if you allow yourself to be moved by the moment, you can play with it, you can, you can feel it, you can roll with it, you can buck against it a little bit, you can feel that motion, you can feel the change in the moment as you pay attention. And then you're using every ounce of everything that the subject is offering you and suggesting to you and guiding you to see. And that's an amazing thing to be able to do, to feel the moment ebb and flow from you, coming in, coming out, tasting the moment, being so aware and tuned in and awake in every single sense to all that is offered to you all the stillness, all the silence, and all the respect that you're, you can muster. And I think that's a fabulous thing, you know? And when you're done, you can turn away and leave with a grateful heart, allowing your subject to, to rest and know that on the day you gave your best to the subject, you were open, you were aware, you were awake, you paid full attention. And both you and the subject gave the best you could on the day, regardless of light, weather, cameras, whatever. You know, 
Remember, it's not the, the quantity of images that you make, but the quality of the experience that moves you to commit a single moment to film or to a digital camera. You know, that's your legacy. That's your life. And it reveals the, that unique, transient and fragile beauty that is unique to you. And that's what photography is. It's you. There's so much of you in every photograph and every photograph tells your story. Every photograph is a self-portrait. And with that, I finished a little bit earlier, Jane. I'm very sorry. I, don't, I thought I was going to go on for another five minutes, but um, I've got... <laughs> maybe I spoke too quickly. I'm sorry if I did. Um, but if That's anybody all. has any questions, I'll, um, I'll stop sharing my screen and then we can go through the... Um, go through the chat if that's okay. Um, certainly, uh, thank you very much. No, that was that was beautifully paced and actually for me certainly quite meditative in itself. Um, that was a lovely flow of images and, uh, and a lovely narrative as well. So thank you very much for that indeed, uh, Paul. Um, I'd like to just hand over to Sarah now from the art collection at the University of Stirling our partner here tonight and and Sarah's going to talk us through the questions so guys please pop your questions into chat but there's a few there already to get going with so thank you very much Sarah. Thanks Jenny thanks for I just thought it was wonderful I keep on like I've written lots of things down like paying attention to your subject is the perfect meditation lots of things that to take away from it but I'll, I'll just go through some of the questions um Janet had asked do you ever make pictures in colour? No, I don't. Um, it's it's a, a funny thing. I, I see colour, but I see colour and then translate it in my head to tones. Um, I find colour itself quite shouty. Um, so I enjoy the, um, the, the sort of the texture and the light and the suggestion in black and white photography. I find it simpler. Um, I'm also technically not that gifted at colour photography. Um, I, I genuinely do struggle. So my camera is set to black and white. It's also set to square. So you'll notice that I think the majority, if not all the pictures were square there. Um, yeah, so I shoot square and I shoot black and white. Um, and I, um, I, I do use color a lot when I, when I photograph in black and white because different colors represent as different tones. But um, yeah, for me, color is like having my arm scraped with a cheese grater. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and, and Erin's asking actually on that on that note, how do I set my camera to black and white? Oh right. Um, so it depends on what camera you've got, but most of them in the menu have something called picture style um, or film simulation, and there you can set the um, the cameras to uh, to black and white. You can, of course, convert them to black and white in software afterwards if your camera doesn't. Um, and then you can, um, if you use Lightroom or Photoshop um, or Snapseed, if you're using a telephone, um, you can adjust the, the way the colours represent as tones as well. Thanks. And Francis is asking, is there a particular subject where its stories intrigued you so much that it's stayed with you? Oh, that's, yes, that's a really great question because I get intrigued by everything I photograph. Um, but the, the ones that sort of stay with me the longest usually are, are pictures of trees, weirdly. I absolutely love trees. I'm a big tree hugger. Um, you know, if, if ever you lose me, if I'm ever, ever I'm doing a workshop and you lose me, you'll probably find me hugging a tree. I, I love the, the fact that trees have been around for such a long time and they, they grow in a, in a kind of unruly shape. Um, and wherever they stand, they just look so wonderful. So trees intrigue me, the story of trees intrigue me. Um, and often I, I marvel at, you know, why, uh, why one tree grows in a place um, and, you know, why another tree doesn't. Uh, I'm fortunate enough to live next door to some woodland as well. So I spend a lot of time watching the trees. And I love the way that at the end of the year, the trees discard of their leaves. They just let go of the stuff that gives them life for the rest of the year. And it, they just, it's just gone. And they don't hold on to anything. 
Yeah, and I, I really love that. It's a great metaphor for life, I think. So trees in general, I will say. <laughs> you are going to love coming to the university. Paul's coming up to do a workshop with us in, in November and we've got our own arboretum. So we'll have to take you oh. all the trees and you can you can see all of yeah. that. Uh, no the tree will remain unhugged. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see why it should. <laughs> David's asking, is there a reason for being drawn to a square crop? He says he uses a six by six in an old Hasselblad. He finds yeah. himself using this crop quite often now. I, um, I think the, the square format, the one to one ratio is absolutely beautiful. Um, I think it, it simplifies things. It forces you to change the way you work with, uh, with the subject. Um, you have to pay very careful attention to the, the balance of the, the composition in a square frame. Um, and I started with a, an old Bronica six by six camera when I started photographing years and years ago. Um, so now I've, I've got, I've kind of come full circle. Um, you know, so I started with that and then, I, you know, as a news photographer, you only shoot uh, the sort of standard 35 mil shape. Um, and, and now I've come, back to square and I just love it I see in squares whenever people do workshops with me I'm always cropping their pictures to squares they must find it so frustrating because that's that's how I see I'm quite blinkered in many ways which is quite bad I, I shouldn't be I should be more open uh, but I, I love it the other the other advantage and people think that I'm not being serious when I say that is that indecision is is huge within photographers we don't know whether to shoot it portrait or landscape uh, by shooting square you don't have to worry about turning your camera upright or landscape and it's one less decision to make uh, which allows you deeper connection with your subject so and, and I'm, I could be on as being lazy um, but <laughs> I love that that idea actually that's fantastic yeah. <laughs> Janie's asking do you write poetry I do yes I love poetry um, absolutely love. I'm obsessed by poetry I probably buy more books about poetry than I do photography um, but uh, both photography and poetry sit together so well because they are both an experience of a moment that is unique to a person um, and everybody can write poetry you know we, we get we, we live in fear of it from school because they they tell you you've got to do it like this and you've got to do it like that and you've got to do it like the other so we, we, we lose touch with it and we think it's a little bit too highbrow, but actually poetry is the most beautiful and basic form of communication of a moment. Um, and I, I put photography right alongside it, um, you know, because most photographers can't spell to save their lives, um, myself included, but it doesn't matter if you can't spell. It doesn't matter if you don't know where the commas go. You know, it's just an expression. Um, and the same way with photography, it doesn't matter if you don't know all the technical stuff, you know, that, that can be learned over time, but the ability just to get it down on paper, just to get it onto film or into print is, um, is the key thing. Yeah, we were having some lovely comments in the chat. Um, Anne said that she needs to go back to reacting to real life events with photographs and sometimes an image speaks to you and asks to be captured when your mind is open so I think that's yeah that's lovely yeah that's beautiful yeah that's really beautiful um Roger's saying um to what extent do you seek to capture the moment in camera rather than seek to regain the feeling in post-processing um, I would like to say all the time, but that would be lying. Um, it would be it would be great to be able to capture everything in camera perfectly. Um, I probably I'm probably about 75, 25 uh, that I get it right in camera. Um, you know, there are some things that you, you have to do in post processing um, in the same way that you would, you know, take a negative into the dark room and, and print it. You might print it a little bit. You might want it a bit darker than you, you'd photographed. You might want it a little bit lighter. You might want to darken an area down to draw attention to something that was really the point of focus. Um, and I, I think that's, that's absolutely fine. I don't agree with cloning things out of pictures or adding things in. Um, and I think a lot of that is down to my news background where we weren't allowed to do that. Um, but for me, I just prefer the sort of the eyewitness side of my life 
you know, this is where I am, this is what I'm seeing, and I will move my feet or change my lenses to get rid of, um, uh, you know, sort of objects that I don't that I don't want in the pictures. Cameron's asking, do you use film stimulations for any of your compositions? Um, yeah, I shoot with um, a Fuji film camera um, and that has a film simulation called Across Red, um, which is a black and white, slightly higher contrast um, setting. So I really like that. So my camera is set to that all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it sort of, it works for me. I, I, I enjoy that. And when I come to put the images on the computer, I probably, if I spend five minutes processing the image in, in Lightroom, that's, that's all I spend because I, I, I get it most of the way there and it's just little tweaks. I don't like sitting behind the computer. Um, okay, um, Ian's saying, it's quite a long on comment we're gonna say, I noticed your comment on embodiment and interaction as a two-way communicative process. Did you notice this as you progressed with your own self-development? Yes. Absolutely, 100%, because when I first left the Times, I was trying to photograph in a way that was acceptable. And I saw in magazines and books, um, and it took me a long time. It was actually my therapist who noticed that the work that I, because at that point I, would photo, I was photographing in colour because I thought it was acceptable. Um, and people liked colour pictures. And it was my therapist that noticed that my black and white pictures told a different story. And she asked me to talk about the photographs, um, not in the technical, but the, what I felt. And that was when I really started to get in touch with, I'm photographing my feelings, I'm photographing my, um, you know, my life through seeing something in something else, but I didn't really understand it at the time. So I've, um, I've done a, a lot of, of reading and understanding about the power of photography and how you resonate with something for a particular reason. You know, you might go somewhere in the hope of photographing a particular mountain, but you might end up photographing a fallen tree uh, because that represents where you are emotionally, spiritually, you know, and, and you can see something in it whereas other things will on a, a given day will leave you cold. And then you'll go back a year later or a couple of days later and it will be completely different. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of people who've written on the power of photography as a therapeutic tool. Um, and I think that's, it's so right um, because it's a wonderful way to, to lose yourself in, in the moment, but really, really study what you're, what you're seeing and why you're seeing it. Um, and you answer a lot of the questions yourself while you're going through the process. Um, absolutely fabulous. Yes, it's, it's absolutely making me think I've done the same walk every Monday throughout lockdown and taken yeah. a photo every time I've gone on the walk and the way the same spot changes throughout the seasons and I see something yeah. that's really making me think of that. Um, yeah. Eric's saying is making him look forward even more to his OCA course in photography as a tool for a psychogeography. So that's really Blimey. interesting. And, that and sounds fun. a lot of people are saying that black and white photos seem to bring out the drama a lot more. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I mean, you can be, you can be very dramatic with black and white, but you can also be very subtle. So you can be quite heavy handed with it and you can be very gentle as well. Um, yeah, so you can have uh, a different pace um, for your for your pictures, and you can in color. I know I know photographers who photograph beautifully in color, and see the world in a way that I I can't. Um, and that doesn't mean they're better than me or I'm worse than them. It just means we're different, and that's and that's fine. Um, there are people who photograph in black and white who do it a lot more beautifully than I will. Um, but again, it doesn't mean I'm not good enough, or that they're too good, or whatever, or that I'm jealous of them. It just means that we're in a different place. And accepting that stops me beating myself up. I mean, I've done that for years and I don't need to do it anymore. I mean, I'm 53. <laughs> My punches are getting weaker. <laughs> oh, we've got another message coming. Um, so 
Um, Jane is saying, beyond your own pleasure, how do you share your work? Um, most of it goes on to Instagram um, under discover still. It's discover underscore still. Um, so I put work on there. I post about once a week and um, all of the posts are um, have a little bit of writing with them. It's kind of like a, a personal journey, uh, journal um, and they're all related to mental health or well-being. I do a lot of work with um, Mind, the charity, um, helping people who suffer with mental health problems to, to regain confidence um, through photography. Um, I find that really rewarding. Um, so most of the most of the um, uh, workshops that I do have a mindfulness and mental health and well-being um, sort of feel to them. Uh, so yeah, Instagram is where you'll see it. But you know, if you want to read, um, there's usually a long caption. <laughs> uh, but it resonates with some people; it doesn't with others, and I don't mind. Um, it's very personal. And who inspires you? Um, I'm inspired by, um, photographically, um, I love the work of Michael Kenner. I love the work of Bill Brandt and Robert Kappa. Um, I really love the work of the Japanese photographer Kobayashi. Um, I love the, um, the work of Minor White, just blows me away every time. Um, I really enjoy that and his essays. Um, I'm inspired by numerous poets um, and, and writers um, and uh, artists as well, so, you know, painters. Um, Rothko in particular for some bizarre reason and yet he does blocks of colour figure that one out <laughs> <laughs> all drawn to the opposite <laughs> exactly yeah yeah uh, Cameron this might be a chance for you to maybe mention a little bit about the workshop that we're planning on doing but uh, Cameron says do you believe photography should be used more as a tool to get people outdoors as they're now doing with gardening absolutely yes um, I think going for a walk with your camera and pausing to notice little things and like you do on your on your walk Sarah you know little things that change and you photograph something it doesn't have to be an award-winning picture you don't have to say oh I'm not good enough to take a photograph just noticing something and spending a little bit of time looking at it and photographing it and maybe keeping it on your phone or doing a little print and putting it in a, in a journal um, I think it's so uplifting it inspires you it encourages you to notice change it encourages you to communicate with the world around you it's a very very powerful tool um, some of the some of the workshops i do um, i work with um, a lady who does forest bathing so we do photography and forest bathing um, and for those of you who don't know forest bathing is not running into the woods in your speedos it's spending it's effectively spending time with nature um, and they say if you spend two hours in the woods, the, um, the little fight inside, the chemicals that the trees release are, um, are really, really good for your mood. They're better than um, some of the antidepressants that we take. Um, yeah, so I, I work with her and we experience the forest. So we get down our hands and knees and we've got our fingers in the dirt and we're looking at the little bits and pieces and we're collecting things to do still lives with. Uh, we're seeing the big picture, we're looking at the canopy, we all have trees, um, you know, we, we taste some of the things that are safe to taste in the forest, don't do that without supervision, whatever you do, because it's not, not my fault if you eat a bad mushroom, um, maybe some of you enjoy eating a bad mushroom, I don't know, but, you know, there are lots of things that you can taste, so you're engaging all of your senses in the experience, uh, and the pictures that people make when they're in there are so lovely, because they're just they're quite, you know, they're responding to a moment. They're not pre-planning it. So uh, it, it's a good way of letting go and being free. Um, it's great. It was a really great question, Cameron. Thank you. Janet's asking, did lockdown change the way you worked? Hugely, yes. Um, I uh, used to fly all around the world doing workshops. Um, about the year before lockdown, 2019, I did 42 flights which is quite a lot. And lockdown made me stop and really pay attention to what I wanted to do with the way that I work, which was slow down, be still and notice. And um, 
I I was able to run mindfulness workshops, mindfulness photography workshops online, um, which started out as um, you know sort of three sessions, but some of them ran for eighteen months in the end because people just wanted more and more and more. Uh, and it was a really wonderful way of getting people to see the unique beauty of where they live, because often we take our homes for granted. You know, we leave to go to work and, you know, we come back and we go to bed and we don't we don't think of it as beautiful. You know, and yet we spend more money on our houses. We choose them in a fraction of the second that we might choose a pair of shoes. Um, but we know as soon as we walk in whether it's right or not. Uh, and yet we don't. We don't see how beautiful the light is through the window in the morning. We don't notice the shadows traversing across the wall as the sun moves through the seasons. Um, you know, or the where, where the moonlight comes in. You know, we don't notice the particular smells in different rooms. We become completely immune and we can become blind to it. And I think lockdown taught me that my home is probably the most inspiring place, not because it's incredibly beautiful, but just because I loved grubbing around on my hands and knees in the garden, photographing bits of grass with dew on them and, you know, watching the, the tulips and the alliums come up in the spring and then photographing each stage of their life. Uh, you saw some of them in some of the pictures. Uh, when, you, when you spend a year watching something grow, you, you become really attuned into its changes. Um, and some of those, I, I, was just, I just marveled at every day before I eventually cut them to photograph them. Um, and they seemed okay with that. They, they didn't protest. Francis is asking, do you have a favorite time of day or weather condition to be mindful in while photographing? Oh, yes. I love rain and fog. I, I, I really like the rain and the fog, um, partly because you don't get other photographers out. Um, there are fewer people around. Um, and I like the mystery that fog and rain bring. I love the smell of rain. And I love the sound of rain on an umbrella or a tent or, you know, the hood of my jacket when I'm standing out outside. And I love the way it, it enriches all the colours, brings in reflections. Um, you know, there's so much to enjoy um, about rain. So that's my favourite. Well, you but are I work, I sterling work. then. <laughs> <laughs> we find them, won't we? <laughs> <laughs> I think that's the end, end of the questions. And I said, that was no. Thank you. And the camera's saying it's like an autumn fall along with the snow. So the different. Oh, yeah. I, I love the snow. See, the, the snow hides a lot of things and simplifies. You know, every single season has something special about it. Um, you know, so, uh, so when is the, oh, I've just seen one come up. When is the workshop later in the year? Um, I've got. One in the Lake District in November, one in Cornwall in December. Um, I'm doing another one in Cornwall through a company that I work with called Ocean Capture in February. And then I'm doing a poetry and photography uh, retreat in March. And I'm also doing a workshop up in Torridon, which will be a mindfulness retreat in early January. Uh, which are all going to go on my website and onto Instagram in the next 10 days. And you're, you're with us on, uh, on the 6th of November oh. in Sterling. That's, yeah, 6th of November. <laughs> I, mean, so I couldn't think, I was thinking, when's the one in Sterling? I can't remember, 6th of November. And it'll be yeah. up on, on the, our website soon if anybody wants yeah. to think and come and see Paul. Yeah, sorry, I, I couldn't remember. It's not I have right terrible now. brain fog. <laughs> 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 well, thank you so much. I'm going to hand back to Janie to do sort of formal thanks, but it, I've personally really enjoyed it, Paul. It's been, it's been wonderful uh, and fantastic to see your work and to hear about it. Well, well thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for your uh, lovely comments and observations and questions in the chat. And one final question just slipped in there around how you protect your uh, equipment in the rain? Um, generally, I don't worry. Um, I just let it get wet. But my, my most valuable piece of equipment is an umbrella. Um, so I have an umbrella that I've, I've now had for about three years um, and it goes everywhere with me. So it protects it from the sun, it, it keeps the wind off and it will keep the rain off some of it. 
but I don't worry too much. Um, you know, the camera will get wet. Um, it is weatherproof, allegedly. So um, I don't worry too much. Good stuff. Well, thank you, Nick, for that final question. So thank you again, Paul. I mean, that has been a meditative evening in itself, just listening to you talk and watching your beautiful uh, images glide past on the screen. Um, so thanks again. As Sarah says, we will put a note out to everyone um, through our uh, website at the university, through our channels there and through our social media with the Sterling Photography Festival on your workshop um, in November. And um, we're just gonna have to find somewhere to have you stay because it's COP26 about that time. And I think we're very busy oh, cool. up in Scotland. So, um, and- uh, A tent. <laughs> yeah, exactly, we'll bring a tent. You enjoy tents, you said that, you'll be fine. Um, it's a beautiful campus to camp on, if, that, if that's allowed, Sarah, I don't know. But we really look forward to welcome, welcoming you. Um, yeah. For the benefit of those who are uh, here tonight, if you want to save the chat where there's the odd reference posted, um, you just hover over the three little dots um, in the chat function and you get the option to uh, save chat. Okay, so if you want to capture that. But this is also going to be recorded and uploaded onto the Sterling Photography Festival YouTube channel. Um, and I've just dropped the details of that into chat as well. Um, so we can watch it again, Paul, and we can use it as our evening meditative practice. Yeah. I'm um, good at putting people to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks again. I just say a big round of applause uh, to you for coming tonight and for sharing that with us and being so open um, about your own experiences and what you get from photography. And there's lots of lovely reactions from the, from the audience in that as well. Paul, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you so much, everybody. It's been a, an absolute pleasure to, uh, to speak to you. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. Super, great.